Shut up and sit down. Packer offensive lineman and all-around Midwest guy, TJ Lane, joins us here on Inside Wisconsin. What's up, TJ? What's up, Trev? How you doing, man? Good to see you. Awesome. Good Good to see you. And you just met John Anderson from ESPN. I did meet you. John, nice to meet you as well, virtually. Yeah, uh, you know, I listen, it's, I don't have a number in a program, so I'm harder to figure out, but it's, you know, it doesn't list my height and weight and hometown, but it, it's nice to, to connect here. As I've watched for many years with, with uh, all the hometown team, and uh, it's good to have you. We'll ignore the Lions thing. I understand the pull of home, that's fine, <laughs> but we're going to dismiss that for this, for this particular hour, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'm fine <laughs> with that. That's fine. So, all right, so I'm going to start, and this is obviously always going to be just about me. I'm stuck in a hotel room in Eugene, Oregon, watching track and field, which actually I love. But I maintain that everybody at some point in their life was on a track and field team. Were you? Did you run track in college, in high school? No, I didn't. Not, I did you not. Didn't, nobody recruited you to throw the shot or the disc or any of that. No, John. Actually, I was. I didn't hit the weight room until probably after my senior year, so I wasn't even. Uh, I, I got to tell you, the football team barely wanted me when I was a junior. So <laughs> I was a late bloomer, what, what people like to say. I love it. So, TJ, that's great, man. Like, that's exactly why all of Wisconsin can relate to TJ Lang. You're a Midwestern guy. You grew up just outside of Detroit, and then you get drafted by the Packers. So talk us through that. What was that like growing up a Lions fan, and then all of a sudden, boom, you land here in Green Bay. But obviously, you get Wisconsin. You get the Midwest. You just get us. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, I was thrilled, you know, when, when Green Bay called on, on draft day. Um, I didn't go to the combine, so I had to take, I think it was 10 or 12 pre-draft visits. And, uh, you know, I remember right after, I think Green Bay might have been one of the last ones. And I remember calling my agent. I told him, I said, just please do whatever you can. I, I want to go to Green Bay. <laughs> it just seems like a place that that I would fit in. Uh, reminds me a lot of northern Michigan, where I spent a lot of time as a kid. Uh, just great people, blue-collar town. Um, so I was ecstatic, but yeah, I mean, growing up, I wasn't really necessarily a huge Lions fan, you know, hate to admit it. I, I grew up more of a college football fan, uh, wearing the maize and blue and, and cheering for, uh, you know, the national championship team and, and Charles Woodson back when he was a stud in, in college. And, uh, um, that's really when I fell in love with football though, you know, and not to say that I wasn't a huge NFL fan because I was, um, and when, it, when time came, when I, you know, I didn't really know probably till halfway through my senior year of college that I was going to have a chance in the NFL. And when it did, I just kind of took it. Uh, I, was, I remember just being so grateful because I was going to get into criminal justice and maybe be a cop. And I had a bunch of other people in my family, aunts and uncles that who, who were in the police force. And, uh, you know, when my coaches told me, hey, you got a chance to go. I said, wow, this is great. And I mean, it was just a blessing, you know, and, and a couple nights before the draft weekend in 2009, I remember my mom who's like a very spiritual lady, just she called me one day, she said, I had a dream. Uh, you're going to end up in Green Bay. I just have a feeling. I said, Mom, that would be best case scenario. I'd absolutely love to be in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And to be able to live there for eight years, uh, raise a family, have two children while I while I lived in Green Bay, uh, came in as a 21-year-old kid, left as a 29-year-old adult. I mean, those are those are eight of the best years of my life. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I'm just so thankful and grateful I got the opportunity to play there. The difference um, in living in a Lions community and a Packers community, um, those don't seem to be equal. No, they aren't. And being in in Green Bay, um, especially right around the time that I got there in 2009, that was really the first year of success, you know, under the Mike McCarthy. Well, not the Mike McCarthy, but under the Aaron Rodgers uh, Mm -hmm. takeover. The year before, I think they were – uh, Trevor could tell me 08, maybe six and 10, maybe five and 11 team. Um, we got there in 09. They added some pieces to the puzzle, you know, first year in the playoffs, second year, obviously won the Super Bowl. made the playoffs every single year though. And the expectation was, I think, John, the biggest difference. Um, we knew in green Bay, if we didn't win the Super Bowl, it was a disappointing season. And we knew that every single year and it didn't matter, uh, what new players we brought in, what players left. Uh, the only thing that mattered was winning a Super Bowl. And when you go to Detroit, uh, obviously a team who had, has been struggling for a long time now, hasn't you know won a playoff game uh, 20 years, uh, 30 years. You know, it's been a long time for them. And the expectations was just – they were different. They were almost like what we were trying to do in 2009 in Green Bay, where it was like, let's get to the playoffs and maybe make some noise. That was the expectation in Detroit. We were never able to do it, but um, that was something that kind of – 
uh, drove me to want to play for the Lions because I had the chance, you know, I, I had the pleasure of playing in Green Bay for these great teams and great players and being in the playoffs every single year. We only won one Super Bowl, which um, in my mind is a tragedy, but <laughs> going to Detroit, I, I, I like the challenge of going to a team and trying to be a part of something um, that's going to turn a franchise around. And we didn't get, we, you know, we, I only played two years there. We didn't get to do it, but uh, the fans are very relatable. I mean, in Detroit and in Green Bay, it is football, you know, 24 seven. And in Detroit, you obviously have three other major sports, but it is a football driven city and they want to see a winning team. <laughs> they would sell their children to see a winning team and to see the Super Bowl here in Detroit. And uh, same in, same in Green Bay. The fans are just uh, two, two of the most passionate fan bases in, in the whole league. And it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun playing for both teams. But you did get to grow up watching Barry Sanders. And that's who, by the way, the Packers passed on. Had a chance. We took Tony Mandrich out of Michigan State. Right. But growing up watching Barry Sanders, and they, that couldn't have been terrible. No, it wasn't. But it was terrible watching Barry Sanders and then never getting really rewarded for it. Right. I mean, I think in 2000, or not, I think in 91, they made it to NFC Championship game and end up losing. But yeah. Um, just to watch, it, it seemed like there was so many. I guess like wasted seasons watching Barry, but it was awesome, man. I mean, that really was mid nineties. I'd say was when I probably started to really fall in love with foot with football as an eight, nine year old kid. And uh, I had it on two folds. I mean, getting to watch two of the greatest athletes of all time in Charles Woodson play at Michigan and Barry Sanders play in Detroit. I mean, as a kid watching those two players, how can you not <laughs> how can you not fall in love with the game of football when you're that, when they're when they're that close to home? So yeah, that was definitely a pleasure watching him. So I think we were about six minutes into this interview before the name got dropped. Let's go there, Aaron Rodgers. I mean, TJ, you've been making the circuit because you made a few headlines here and you talked about this. You know, Aaron, uh, and. As I was kind of getting ready for today's show, you also know what this whole contract and negotiating and what it's all about. You and Josh Sitton kind of went through this at the end of your Packer career. Mm -hmm. Josh kind of got, you know, cut, and then you had your whole contract thing. But mm -hmm. maybe this is just the easiest way to put it. What the hell is going on? Well, that's a million-dollar question, Trev. <laughs> <laughs> i got to tell you. I mean, and it's not like, you know, the last couple months – you know, I've talked to a lot of guys that, that I played with uh, for a long time. We played with Aaron Rodgers, and I talked to a lot of guys that are still there playing. And, I mean, the consensus is I don't think anybody knows what the hell is going to happen. And I think that's the uncomfortable part of this whole scenario because usually when there's a holdout of some sort, it's usually contract-related. Hey, let's just give him more money and he'll show up. And uh, all signs point to that not being the case. And. Yeah. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if, you know, they have to guarantee him, you know, four more years, the rest of Jordan Love's contract, whatever it is, to come back and play. Um, I, I really don't know. And I've been back and forth on this thing uh, probably since February about what was going to happen. And I just don't know. And as a player, it's so difficult for those guys in the locker room because uh, there's obviously a lot of guys who've been there for a long time, Devontae Adams, David Bakhtiari, who are, are very good friends of Aaron Rodgers. And they've said in recent weeks, uh, you know, hey, we support our guy, we support our quarterback. And usually that's the best way to, you know, kind of take a uh, buddy stance is just let him handle his business and we'll try to stay out of it. And whichever way we go, hey, we're playing football. But um, there's a lot of unknowns, man. And I think that's – if I was in that locker room, that would be the toughest part because – the season's right around the corner. I mean, you're starting training camp in a month and a half. Uh, then after that, you're rolling right into preseason games, and boom, you're into week one like that. So for those guys in those locker room, if they don't know which direction the organization is going to go or which direction Aaron Rodgers is going to go, um, that can lead to some trouble. And I hope that doesn't happen. I, I, I love Aaron Rodgers. He's a good friend of mine. Um, I think for his legacy, something that he's always wanted – uh, he he I think he he needs to win another Super Bowl to kind of cement himself as one of the best of all time. And it's like I said earlier in this, in this show, it's tragic that he's only won one one Super Bowl ring with how much talent he has and how much talent has been around him. So I, I hope the thing I, I'm still optimistic. I, I still think there's a lot of time, even if he rolls up 
you know, week three at training camp and says, okay, let's go. Like he's going to be their starter. You know, he'll come in ready to go. He'll come in and, and command the, the offense and he'll definitely give a big adrenaline shot to a whole lot of guys yeah. in that team. But yeah. I'm optimistic. I, I still think there is a way for both sides to kind of work through, work through some differences. And, and if you're in Rogers at the end of the day, if you say, Hey, I, my goal is to win another Super Bowl. Well, you're not going to get a better chance to win a Super Bowl than coming back to the Green Bay Packers with the roster they have. In your position, you watch the draft. They draft two. They draft two offensive linemen every year. Mm-hmm. You can never have enough, and you can move them around. So I get it, but you had to get used to it at some point, right? Like every guy, every draft, you're like, all right, well, that guy might be able to take my job. Um, along that, I guess, I guess if you're if you're you know you're Pro Bowl, it's not quite like that. But you know what it is to have new guys come through and cycle through all the time. How do you handle that when you go through and go, okay, here's Here's new dudes because eventually they're going to be younger and they're going to be cheaper. And that becomes a business factor. Yeah. And I think really when I was a young player, I really got emotionally distraught during the draft. I mean, I had bad anxiety, stressed out. My first two years, I was a role player. I was the sixth guy in the offensive line. I started, you know, maybe four or five games, played some spot duties for some injuries. And 2000, going into 2010, I thought, okay, uh, you know, Mark Tauscher's gone. Now there's a spot at right tackle. Now it's my chance, you know, to go and improve myself. First round pick, Brian Balaga, offensive tackle. So I'm saying, well, I hope they're not giving up on me, right? And then going into 2011, okay, we got a spot open at guard. Darren College just left Arizona in free agency. First round, they picked Derek Sherrod, offensive lineman. <laughs> so as a young player, you're sitting there like, wow, you know. And and I, I also think it's a good thing because as the more I played, the more I realized – the better players that come in and challenge you for your spot, like the competition, I mean, just brings out the best of everybody. And by the time I got to probably year four, year five, you know, when I had been starting for three or four years and, and knew that, you know, I was a solid player, I could, I, I didn't care less who they drafted. I really didn't. You know, I, I thought, okay, this guy can come in and maybe help out if there's an injury or two, or, you know, if this guy leaves, whatever. But, you know, w- once you have that confidence that you're a good player and you're a Pro Bowl type player, I don't think it really worries you who comes and who goes. And with Aaron Rodgers, look, I mean, is it like a two or three time MVP? I mean, he, he's one of the best to ever play the game. So I don't think the Jordan Love pick to him was necessarily threatening for his position. I just thought in my mind, and I'm not speaking for him, I'm thinking, well, you know, you're one game away from winning the Super Bowl and they just drafted my backup quarterback who's going to be the starter in three or four years. Why not go get some somebody that's going to come be a huge part of this team right now, not in three or four years? And I think that was kind of some sort of build up throughout really. I mean, my last couple of years there, 14, 15, 16, John, where we had a really good team and we'd have a couple of injuries and we we're all in the locker room kind of chattering. Who's, you know, who's a free agent out there? Who can we – go trade for who's unhappy and instead of really going to get people and get pieces and trading maybe a first or second round pick to go get a star player well let's just move this guy to this position this guy to this position and and I think that kind of builds up after time and I think if you're in Rodgers I think well I don't think I mean obviously he kind of hit his breaking point with that and, and, and it's not only the guys that they are bringing in but it's also the guys that they've let go throughout the years that have been uh, very, very key players and great leaders on that team um, where they've been close and you see uh, Jordy Nelson leave, Randall Cobb leave, uh, NFC Championship game, then Brian Balaga leaves. This year, NFC Championship game again, uh, we're going to let Corey Lindsley leave. I think that all of, you combine all of that, I think it, it ultimately just hit a breaking point for him. And quick, just to make the point so that we know we're not all like naive, you, you, can be, you can be the sixth guy in the offensive line and play some. Uh, it's, the quarterback's the only place where we only got one of them, right? Maybe kicker. But other than that, right, we can find – we can carry a lot of defensive backs. We can carry a lot of linebackers. And all the only position, though, that only there's only one dude is quarterback. And so it right. does make it a different situation. Yes. Yeah, it does. I mean, you're the so, guy. Yeah, <laughs> you're the guy. And those guys, those guys, some of them have big egos. And when they bring in somebody to challenge them, you know, I think it's not only Aaron Rodgers, but you've seen it pretty much every year in the league. Uh, mm-hmm. Some of those guys take it personal. And I think Aaron Rodgers took it personal last year. He goes out and throws for 45, whatever <laughs> touchdowns it was, and wins the MVP. Yeah. So, obviously, if Green Bay was trying to ignite a flame, you know, under his ass, I don't know if that was their intent, but they obviously did, not only on the field, but also with some offseason <laughs> issues as well. Yeah, I was going to say, it worked for a minute. <laughs> we had a great season, and now it's a shit show. Um, yeah. Tej, you were here eight years. <laughs> you, uh, 
you get Wisconsin, and there was a point in your career mm-hmm. where I think the entire state embraced TJ Lang for him, him, his personality. You're a natural at this stuff on camera and behind the mic. But there was this time when uh, it was, I believe, after this thing called the Fail Mary, where <laughs> TJ Lang took to Twitter and was like, you know what? F it, NFL. Find me. Get the real refs back. And in the the newness of Twitter, that went about as viral as a tweet could go. Uh, And Wisconsin was like, hey, uh, that's how we talk. That's what we think. (laughs) That was great. Um, And so what was it, Tej, about Wisconsin that really, you know, I don't know, you get us and we get you? Uh, You know what? I I think it's honestly just being a Midwestern guy. I mean, everywhere I go in the Midwest – you find uh, the tendencies that people are pretty much the same. You know, there's a lot of really blue collar towns and hardworking people and guys just want to go do their job, take care of the family, wake up, watch their football games on Sunday. You know, that's just kind of how I grew up. And, and being in a town like Green Bay, like I said, reminded me a lot of, uh, of a lot of Michigan cities that I spent time in as a kid. Going back to that 2012 game in Seattle, I mean, looking back on it now, uh, you know, I was a young kid. You know, I was 20, probably three at the time. I had just signed a new four-year extension, so I kind of felt a little invincible that, like, what are they going to do, cut me? I just signed a four-year contract, you know? Um, But but at the same time, we're all sitting on the bus after that game, and we're watching the replays, and we're looking at our phones, and everybody's, oh, did you see this? Did you see this? And Jeff Saturday was on the team, and he was – uh, pretty high up in the players' association at the ter- the players' union at the time, and uh, you know there was a bunch of us that just started sending stuff out, just rapid fire because we were upset, right? And and football is such a hard game. Uh, you spend so much time just trying to get everything right, and you only have one chance per week to go out there and, and get it right. And one, ga- and usually at the end of the season, well, when you're sitting there at you know ten and six in a wild card spot or eleven and five, whatever it is, usually you look back at that one game and say, you know. One more play, and boom, we're a 12 win team, 13 win team with a one seed. We got home field advantage. And that all, that all just kind of boils up post game, right? Um, so I don't know if I, maybe at the time I was pretty new to Twitter. Maybe I would have held back on the F bombs a little bit, but I don't, I don't regret, I don't regret kind of, and, and I was kind of the spokesman for everybody that was on the bus at the time. Everybody wanted to do it. And I'm like, you know what? Dude, I'm going to do it. Like, like, go, let's go. And then I just started ripping them off. And, I got an earful from, you know, from the coaches and management. But at the same time, I think everybody knew I was right. And Jeff Saturday had our backs because there was a couple other guys that sent some tweets out, too. And he's like, I'm going to call the union and I'm going to tell them, like, these, you bet I don't want any of these guys fine because you guys know it was horseshit, too. And, you know, so <laughs> nothing ended up coming to the whole thing. Thank God. But, yeah, I think I that, that. I, I, I would agree with you. I think that was really the first time where, uh, you know, as, as a player, I felt like, okay, you know, I've got a little voice in Green Bay and I've got some people that are, you know, starting to become fans a little bit. I don't want to do that after every game, but, you know, I, I feel like that during that moment, um, it was a, an appropriate response. So that little escapade didn't cost you anything? No, no it no, didn't. No fine, no nothing? Nothing. And I don't know how it didn't, John. I think I think everybody knew how bad of a mess up it was from the NFL that they just kind of swept everything under the rug. Yeah. And actually the next week we got the regular referees back. So I, I take a small tor- piece of credit towards that as well. Yeah. Cause in 2021, that's in 2021, that's a five figure, five figure payout. Yeah, that is. You can't do it this day and age. I mean, with Twitter back in the day, 2012 was a little bit different. I think we right. all know that <laughs> today, uh, young kids, players do not try to challenge your bosses. The NFL do not try to ch- challenge any giants because like you said, they will definitely make you pay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, we'll take a break with the the, uh, the great words of Herman Edwards. Don't press send. <laughs> More with TJ Lang, former Packer offensive lineman and all-around Midwestern guy in just a minute. We are inside Wisconsin. Helpful critiques, ideas, great stories, people we should know, the great bar in your town, the fish fry that you want to know, the fish boil, anything that you want to reach out to us with, we are happy, we are here. You can be the inputters. We're here to listen. Shut up and sit down. 